Welcome to Say More from Boston Globe Opinion. I'm Shirley Leung. If you follow my work, you know I have sons, two of them. Even though I sometimes wonder what it would be like to raise girls, I like having boys most of the time, but it is hard. In a world of Me Too, incels, and the manosphere, I worry for my boys, and I wonder if I'm raising them right. I'm not alone. Joining me today is Ruth Whitman, author of a new book called Boy Mom, Reimagining Boyhood in the Age of Impossible Masculinity. Ruth, welcome to Say More. Thank you so much for having me on the show. So you have three sons. Tell me their ages. So actually, my oldest two are pretty much the same age as your two. So I, my eldest is about to turn 14 next month. Then I have a 10, nearly 11-year-old, and I have a six-year-old. Great. And you start your book out about you're pregnant with your youngest child, Abe. Yes. Uh, you knew you were having a boy. And talk about the reaction you got when people learned you were having a third son. Right. So I just want to set this in context a little bit because my third son was born in 2017, right at the end of 2017. So it was a really specific moment in the history of the ways that we talk about men and boys and masculinity. It was right as the Me Too movement was exploding, like Weinstein had just been exposed. And Mm -hmm. it was like this domino thing that every time I opened my phone, there was another like terrible story about how badly men were behaving, all this systemic harm. And when people knew that I was pregnant with a third boy, I usually got, they almost sort of looked at me as if I was going off to war or something, or as if... (laughs) Oh I God. told them that, you know, we were, uh, that I, our whole family just kind of had this stomach flu or something. It was like, oh, three boys. Oh. And, you know, and the fact that we went into this voluntarily, we this was actually, our third baby was actually from a leftover frozen embryo from a previous IVF cycle from my second son. We knew he was a boy before I decided to get pregnant with him. So, you know, people were like, I can't believe that you're voluntarily signing up for this. You know, it wasn't congratulations. It was more sympathy. So I've heard of the term girl dad, um, but this term boy mom, it's it's relatively new to me. And frankly, it only occurred to me when I saw it might be something when I saw it as the you know title of your book. Right. Yeah. And uh, and so so I guess I, I'm a boy mom, too, then. And, you know, um, and so I was wondering, have you always identified as a, a boy mom? No, so it's not an identity that I just completely embrace uh, uncritically at all. So the boy mom, it's kind of a hashtag that people use online and people use it in very different ways, but often in quite sort of essentializing and sexist ways, both for um, both for the boy part of it and for the mom part of it. Sometimes it's used as a kind of like, oh, boy moms, you know, we have to put up with so much mud and so many fart jokes and so much, you know, pee around the toilet. And there are a lot of fart jokes. There are a lot of fart jokes. (laughs) Right, exactly. It's this idea that boys are these like rowdy little scamps and moms are these kind of like devoted servants that kind of run around after them and clean up the mess. So what does the word mean to you? So that's a really interesting question. I When we chose that uh, title for the book, I felt like I wanted to be in conversation with all of those stereotypes. I didn't embrace them fully. I don't really see myself as a boy mom in the sense of the online identity. But it was just like, it's this thing, it's very evocative. I think this idea of like, boy, uh, you know, mother and son, it goes back to these really mm-hmm. primal feelings in all of us. So I thought it worked as a title for a book to kind of spark conversation and ideas rather than as something that I was just like, yes, that's me. I identify with it. So so talk about what motivated you to write this book. You know, what questions were you setting out to answer? When my third son was born, as I said, it was this in this moment where the conversation around men and boys and toxic masculinity and all of these sort of headlines about systemic male harm were really in people's minds. It was such a fraught and complicated conversation. And I felt that the culture had kind of almost split along politicized gender lines. So it almost felt like if you were 
a progressive or a feminist, you were kind of furthering the cause of women and girls. Whereas if you were kind of conservative or mm. on the right of politics, then you kind of identified with the cause of men and boys. And so I felt a real pull between my political identity and my mom identity. You know, I'm a feminist. I'd always identified as a feminist. And suddenly I'm raising three boys. And it felt like the left was telling me that to even care about boys was somehow a betrayal of feminism. And so I wanted to dig into all of it and all of the conflicted feelings and all of the complex political questions and the parenting questions all in one book. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, when when reading your book, I mean, I couldn't help but feel that part of the motivation was just to understand your kids better. Um, yes. And and walk me through that. I mean, because because I felt like the, reading your book, that's what I felt like. I've, and, and I'm 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 in the same journey, right? In the same boat with, with these boys. Like, I, I want to understand these boys because I, I grew up as a girl and it was completely different experience, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, I was really blindsided when I had boys within what they were actually like day to day. I mean, I'd grown up with this, you know, in a very feminist household. I had, was under the impression that gender was all socialized. When I had boys, I was actually just completely bowled over by how different they were. Yes. You know, how wild, how physical, how rambunctious, all of those sort of boy stereotypes, you know, that I pushed back so hard against. And I was like, oh, it's not true. It's all socialized. It's all made up. And there it was day to day in my own life, in my own family. It was a journey to really understand what's going on with them, you know, how I can help them, what's normal, and how to sort of think about my own feelings about it, you know, how to sort of process my own relationship with them as well. I mean, I, I think what struck me about having boys, I mean, I want, my husband and I, we wanted a girl, you know, we yeah. wanted our first boy to be a girl, but... And then it was like, oh, you're disappointed. I, for me, it was like you're disappointed for a second, but you, you know, you love, you know, you love your child, you know, boy or yes. girl, you, you love your children, and, um, and for me, I've, I've always struck by from a very young age, they have a certain amount of confidence, you know, that I, I didn't see in myself. I feel like only as a. 30 or 40 year old or 50 year old woman that I feel confident. Like, I feel like they're born confident. It's like, where does this come from? <laughs> I don't know if you felt that way too. Cause I, I mean, like I spent my last 10 years of my career as a columnist writing about how to advance women. I write, I write about, you know, how to, uh, you know, put more women in the boardroom, how to get more female CEOs, you know, how to elect the first, you know, female mayor or governor. And so um, I, I've been so focused on that. And then, and then it's so it's it's quite I, I have to wrap my heads around trying to understand, you know, boys or men from a very young age. You know, it's it's. Yeah. And I feel similarly because, you know, my whole career, my whole writing career has been or well, much of it has been around feminism and advancing the cause of women and girls and sort of pointing out the ways in which women and girls have been oppressed and disadvantaged. I think I'd grown up with this idea that, you know, Men and boys are very privileged that patriarchy and all of these systems just work perfectly for them. They're the beneficiaries of all this stuff. Women and girls are the ones who are disadvantaged. And it wasn't until I had my own boys, until I started reporting this book and looking at some of the systemic forces, that I realized that this system isn't actually working well for them mm -hmm. either. You yeah. know, that patriarchy is really not doing them any favors. I like the way that you talk about it as confidence, actually, because often people tend to use much more negative language, I think, when they talk about boys, you know, that they're they're badly behaved, that they're entitled, that they're overly wild, that they can't sit still, you know. And so thinking of that as confidence, you know, as a mother is sort of a nice a nice spin on it, I think. So, Ruth, you also did a lot of reporting for the book. Um, so tell me about some of your reporting trips. Oh, so I went to Utah to a like therapeutic boys uh, residential community where it's all about masculinity. I went to other therapy centers. I went to a fancy prep school in New York. I went to a conference for boys who had been accused of campus sexual assaults. I went into the manosphere and talked to incels and people involved in these like 
misogynistic groups. And I just talked to lots and lots of regular boys about their lives as well, and lots of experts who work with boys. And then I just interviewed many, many boys of just sort of ordinary boys of different types of backgrounds, you know, just to hear about their lives, what they thought about, um, you know, everything from screen time to sex, porn, friendship, um, romance, love, um, and just a masculinity and just to talk to them about their lives. I mean, that I, I, I thought that was great. Just finding, I mean, because you 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 wonder about your boys, right? Like, what will they be like when they grow up? Or what is it like navigating this world? And so, you know, my boys spend a lot of time, you know, online. And and one of them is less social than the other. And, and I worry, you know, he might, you know, go on these online forums or whatever and, and become radicalized. I mean, I really worry yeah. about that. I mean, I, wor- I, I mean, every time I see a mass shooting, I I kind of zero in on the profile. Let me think it's young, male, lonely yes, man. man. It's like, yes. how do we, I mean, I I truly fear like, how do I not raise a, a mass shooter? I mean, I don't know if you have yeah. that fear too, you know? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's a scene in the book where um, I went to the, see this therapist um, and it was really supposed to be to talk to her about my son's anxiety, yeah. but it ended up just the whole conversation just turned into talking about my anxiety. And she's like, you know, well, what is your greatest fear? And, you know, it was absolutely that, you know, this school shooter, this profile of this lonely kid who's isolated and and then gets radicalized on the internet. And that was my greatest fear. And I think it's a very, very common fear for parents of boys. Yeah. And so, so I'm like, that is my, one of my goals, you know, how do I make sure that I get him to a place where he feels comfortable, um, you know, has connections and and doesn't, you know, and it's just, you know, feels part of this world and welcomed in this world, you know, which is something yes. that I wouldn't have talked about before having boys, you know, I would yeah, have been like, absolutely. it's women that need to be advanced, right? <laughs> right. And I think that, you know, loneliness was a theme that came up across the board when I mm-hmm. talked with boys. It was, you know, so yes, there's the sort of stereotype of the loner guy in his parents' basement who yeah. who gets radicalized. But loneliness was actually so baked into boy culture. You know, yeah. even boys that I spoke to who had a lot of friends on the face of mm-hmm. it, they often felt that those relationships were quite shallow and not very intimate and they couldn't really be vulnerable or emotional with those friends. Mm-hmm. You know, in the way that most girls yep. find it quite easy to access that kind of intimacy, they talk about their lives, they process their feelings and their emotions in groups. I think masculinity norms like really push boys away from those things. Mm -hmm. And then you add in screens and, you know, the kind of general isolation of our culture on top of that. I think Mm -hmm. it really makes, you know, it's an old problem bumping up against a new problem, I think. More of my conversation with Ruth Whitman after this short break. So one of my big takeaways from your book is how our society is suffering from an epidemic of undercared boys. And instantly my kind of working mom guilt set in. I was like, oh, it's my fault. I'm not present enough. Um, so what does this undercare crisis mean to you? I think what I was getting at is that um, there are ways in which we care for boys slightly differently than how we care for girls. And this, these differences show up right from babyhood, really right from birth. And when I was looking at this, what was interesting is that we sort of, we project onto boys all these kind of like masculine qualities. You know, we think of them even from like baby, baby boys as being tougher, stronger, sturdier. People handle them differently. Um, There's all this research that shows that both parents, mothers and fathers, talk with uh, boys less in general and especially talk with boys less about their emotions and their feelings and they're less willing to kind of accept boys' feelings. I thought maybe it was just because boys are sturdier, boys are tougher, you know, than girls and so they need less care. But when you look at the research, it's actually the complete opposite. Baby boys are actually more fragile, more emotionally vulnerable. Their right brains, which is the part that deals with um, emotions and self-regulation and forming attachments, their right, the right brain of a baby boy is about a month behind the right brain of a baby girl at 
birth. So actually, baby boys need more care. They need more of that nurture, more of that support. But because of the way we sort of think about masculinity and who boys are and what they need, we end up giving them less care. Mm -hmm. And so this becomes this like double whammy in a way. They need more, they get less. And this kind of compounds and compounds and compounds throughout childhood. Mm -hmm. And then another part of the book that resonated me was this, how boys suffer from a crisis of connection. And um, I literally spent the summer telling my 13-year-old to connect with one classmate in person over the summer. And I don't think he ever did. And I mean, I I guess at least, you know, the boys... Other boys didn't reach out to him. So it, it's not just him. I mean, right? It, yeah. His friends didn't reach out to him and he did not reach out to his friends. So, yeah. I mean, and girls, of course, are the complete opposite, right? You know, yeah. my, my they, they form deep bonds and friendships from an early age. So, yeah. so how can boy moms help? Boy moms can help in various ways. I think, and again, you know, going back to your previous question, I don't want any of this to come across as like mom shaming or like that it's anybody's fault. I think it's just sometimes when we can identify these patterns and look at our unconscious biases, then then we can start to correct for them or make a difference. So I think the very first thing is in connecting with our own kid. You know, I think that moms often naturally give girls more interaction, more care, more help around social things, more uh, help and discussion of emotions. So I think once we know that, we can kind of start to correct for it. You know, we, to listen to our boys' emotions, to give them that kind of intense nurture. You know, I think as a mom of boys, I quite often hear like, oh, they just need more wrestling. You know, what you want to do with your boy is like wrestle him. And it's just like, They get a lot of that. Right. (laughs) Boys get so much of that kind of physical play, but much less of that kind of emotional engagement, emotional and social nurture. So it's about building the best possible relationship with your son, connecting with him as much as possible. And that can look like just sort of following his lead, um, you know, listening to the very real emotions that show up rather than the ones that you necessarily think he should be feeling. And then in terms of like prioritizing connection with others, you know, I think this is just trial and error. It's different for different kids, but it's, I think it's partly about limiting the amount of screen time, Mm -hmm. which is so hard. And I struggle with this, you know, I am in no way a great model of this, you know, it's so hard. And I think raising kids is really tricky and screens are often, you know, in a culture where we don't have a lot of support or a good social safety net, screens often become our only kind of childcare option. But I think, you know, if we can limit them a bit and just like push through that discomfort, because I know with my boys, you know, they get so dependent on screens that they lose those skills and that Mm -hmm. social muscle to do anything else. So their friends do come over and then they're like, "Uh, can we play video games? Can we go on the screen? You know, and just pushing through that discomfort and allowing kids to like find the path. They do eventually find a way to do it. Mm -hmm. It's just building that muscle. Mm -hmm. So has writing this book changed the way you parent? It has. You know, it really has. It's quite subtle. I wouldn't say that it's like, you know, here's my 10 tips for for changing the way that you parent. But I think it's something subtle but very profound has changed in the sense of my orientation towards parenting my sons, you know, in my relationship with them, in what I believe that they need, and in how I view the world through their eyes. So I think, you know, there was a part of me, you know, having a son, especially during the time of Me Too, that it was kind of like my job was to to sort of stop the harm, to like, mm-hmm. you know, to, to be really strict with them and really clamp down on them and make sure that I kind of controlled their behavior so that they didn't end up being this like predator or rapist or school shooter Toxic or something. Toxic male, right? <laughs> Toxic male, yeah. And I think this was a type of parenting that was rooted in fear. You know, it was just like, I've got to stop this and, you know, I've got to be extremely strict and just make sure it doesn't happen. But what I realised is that the only way to raise an empathetic son is to empathise with him. You know, the only way to raise a son that connects in the real world it, and wants to care for other people is to care for him. So rather than like punishing him or having this like punitive tone, it's like to approach it all from the point of view of nurture and connection and love and relationship. So, I mean, obviously I always loved my son. It's Mm -hmm. just, or my sons, obviously, but it's just a slight orientation in my feeling about what they need and what being a good 
caring to them means. So I've tried to engage with them more generously and I've tried to think about the fact that the world is hard for them. You know, I think a lot of it is about identifying the problems and coming up with a vocabulary and a way of talking about them. Mm -hmm. I think we've done, as women, you know, feminists have done a great job thinking about girlhood and all the ways, all the sexist messages we give to girls about agency, about confidence, about body image, about sex and consent, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think we've got to the point where pretty much any fifth grade girl has the kind of vocabulary and the sort of mental framework to call out when things are sexist, when things are oppressive, when they're being stereotyped. So they can be like, that's sexist and, you know, point it out in the books and the TV shows. And I think they have their own language to describe it. And I think with boys, we're at a much earlier part of that mm -hmm. process. We don't have the vocabulary to call out the problems. We don't have the lens to look at our culture very clearly and to think critically about it and to mm -hmm. see where these problems are. So I think this writing this book helped me just spot the problems, name the problems, give it a voice, give it a framework, and to mm -hmm. just be able to have a language to talk to them about this stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, not you are the problem, but here are all the problems that are facing you. So um, it, it, your book has been out for some time now, and I think you said you that a lot of men have been reading your book. So what are the yes. kind of reactions are you getting from men? So this has been re a really big surprise because when we chose the title Boy Mom, it kind of felt like, oh, we're probably just writing off the possibility yeah, that any me. men You're writing it for me, right? The, yeah, the boy exactly. Moms. <laughs> it's like, and it is still that, you know, boy moms are the largest group of people probably buying and reading this book. But actually, I have been so surprised by the reaction from men. I've had many, many emails and, and messages from men who've said almost that that, you know, and some of them are dads, but a lot of them aren't actually, or that isn't their main focus. They're almost seeing themselves as the boy in it. You know, they're seeing the ways that they were undercared for, that masculinity norms like put pressures on them that kind of stunted them emotionally or made it hard for them to connect. And they feel very seen and validated by this book. It's almost like one man put it that he felt it was like reparenting him, mm, which, you I know, I was like, that. oh, but. Yeah. But then actually, you know, I, I was really, I really kind of admired him for, for saying that. And I think a lot of men feel like there is like a problem in the air that it doesn't feel like things are so great for them. It doesn't feel like mm -hmm. the system's working for them. They don't really have a language to describe it. And they felt very seen and validated by the book, which has been very unexpected and very lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm so glad you wrote this book. I mean, reading this book, I was like, oh, Great. I have a I have one more guidebook <laughs> to being a boy mom. So thank you so much for writing this book for all the boy moms out there. Um, Ruth Whitman is an author. Her latest book is called Boy Mom, Reimagining Boyhood in the Age of Impossible Masculinity. Thank you for being on Say More. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Say More is a production of the Boston Globe. Today's episode was produced by Anna Kusmer. Our editor is Jim Dow. Our engineer is Uzair Ahmed. Our music is from APM Music. If you like the show, please follow us and leave us a review on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can email us at saymore at globe.com. I'm Shirley Leung. Thanks for listening. <laughs>